Dust, rocks, cactus. Baja Peninsula, Mexico. A 1,000 mile long strip of mountains and hostile desert. The Pacific Ocean to the west, the Sea of Cortez to the east, and home to the world's longest nonstop race, the Baja 1000. Most teams who attempt this survival race never see the finish. Could a father and son enter this race, their first desert race, and hope to survive it and even finish? It's 20 after 6, it's going to be uh, 12 hours soon, and we expect Tanner here in about half an hour maybe. Tanner passed pit 9, which is 10 miles away, at 8.29, and he's not here yet. Come on, Tanner. It's very dangerous now, the trophy truck's coming through. Very dangerous. On a one to 10 scale, the Baja 1000 is easily a 12. It's 24 to 47 hours of very little sleep, darkness, booby traps, fires on the race course. We could have the best equipment and this and that, and there's, there's elements of this thing that are unknown that sometimes you don't have any control over. So all you can do is to, you know, do everything in your power that you could think of to make it work. Headlight, the headlight's falling off. On paper, it sounds like, oh, it's a thousand miles. It's it sounds difficult, but you don't really know how difficult it is until you actually come out here and ride it. You've got to fight the terrain, you've got to fight fatigue, you've got to fight hypothermia. A lot of the spectators will pile up rocks on the course, try to build jumps try to deviate the riders, try to cause accidents because they want the mayhem and all the excitement. All the hours of training and practicing and preparation has all come down to this. It's a once in a year deal. And you gotta leave it all there, you know. Life can be an adventure if you make it so. Whatever it is that you decide to do, and we all decide to do different things, is to you know, throw yourself at it 100%. Go at it with everything you've got and try to be the best in the world at what it is that you have decided to do. Right out of high school, I started my own business. Carpentry, call Larry, no job too small. When I was 18, I got a call from a guy who was looking to build a house. And I'd never built a house before, but I knew I could learn how. So, me and my friend Chris, who was 17, and my brother Rick, who was 14 years old, well, we built that house. And I've been building things ever since. Today, my companies employ over 330 people in nine buildings at our campus in Seymour, Connecticut. We have networks of contractors across North America who are our dealers, partners, and friends. I like to defy convention and seek new challenges. I have this real sense that life is to be fully lived and we should use our talents while we're here because soon enough it's gonna be over. We have one chance and that's right now. My son Tanner and I are a lot alike. He's always looking to challenge himself and he's driven to succeed at whatever he sets his mind to. He's accomplished a lot in many endeavors, archery, photography. He was top salesperson at age 19. And currently he competes in obstacle course endurance races and is an engineer in our R&D department. I lead a very interesting research and development project and it's great to be working on it with my dad. We do a lot of things together. A 
I started riding motocross late in life. Uh, I was 32, which is kind of an old guy to start motocross, and it's uh, kind of a painful thing to learn before you stop crashing and, and stuff. But uh, my brother got me into it, my younger brother, who uh, is now a professional freestyle motocross rider. You know, it was just a challenge. You know, I got on his bike, and in 40 seconds, I was in the trees, crashed, and I said, I have to master this. And it took years to do it, but, you know, it's something that you just love. I got Tanner his first bike when he was five years old. And he's been riding ever since, so he's really good at it. I love riding. You get in the zone and you can't think about anything else. When I'm out on the track, I'm always trying to take a corner faster or stay a little lower on a jump just to get slight improvement each lap. Riding faster is more fun. You're not supposed to pass me. Have some respect for your elders. <laughs> We've been riding in places like Utah, across South Africa, Colombia. South Africa. It's like 9,000 feet. So this is the highest pub in Africa. Highest pub in Africa. Well, we reached Glamis Sand Dunes, and they're closed. There's miles and miles of sand, dunes everywhere. It looks extremely amazing. The reason it was closed is because it was 117 degrees out, but it didn't stop us. <laughs> That's a big jump. Sand is so deep. Wow. Is that right? Yeah. We went on a recreational riding trip in January with friends down to Baja with Chris Haynes Adventure Motorcycle Company. And Javier was our guide, and he would say, Hey, we're on last year's Baja 1000 course right now. He said it was the longest nonstop race in the world. And we asked, what's the 1000 stand for? And he said, miles. It didn't seem possible. I decided we should do it. Who might argue? The Baja 1000 is a survival race. They give you the course map for the year's race and that's it. You're on your own to figure out how to do it. There are many classes of vehicles in the race. Trophy trucks are the kings of the course. $1 million, 850 horsepower, fire-breathing monsters with three feet of suspension travel. They can go 140 miles an hour over rough terrain. These guys don't play around. They're in it to win it. In fact, when a trophy truck comes up on another trophy truck, protocol is to rear-end them to get him to let you buy. It's no joke. There are special-built race buggies, ATVs, side-by-sides, and of course, motorcycles. Different engine sizes and vehicle setups create different classes, and you race against the vehicles in your class. Is it dangerous? It's very dangerous. People have been killed in this race. Some things are meant to be. The Entrepreneur of the Year event I attended in Palm Springs, California was the hometown to Chris Haynes, owner and director of Chris Haynes Motorcycle Adventure Company. The event ended one week before the race, and Chris picked us up for a local tour of the area. This will be the smoothest ride Larry will have in over a week. <laughs> it turns out Chris was much more than a recreational tour operator. He was a legend in Baja. So you've been in the race how many times? 32. 32, and you won it how many times? 15. 15. When I started doing this for the first probably 10 years, I competed, there was only two of us. One guy would bring it halfway, the other guy would bring it the other half. That was the way it, the way it worked, you know? Chris is living the dream. He has a beautiful home with antique racing bikes in his living room. 
He collects vintage music art. That's a Jim Marshall photo of the Beatles in 66 at Candlestick Park. Early Beatle pictures. First time Lennon and McCartney played together in that picture. Chris said, surround yourself with what you love. I really like that. Chris and his team provide race support to guys like us who want to race the Baja 1000. You need planning, pre-run bikes, and a special built race bike modified for the race itself. You need chase vehicles, mechanics, lots of spare parts, race experience, and local knowledge. You gonna race again sometime? Uh, I've liked racing from a young, young age, and uh, I've kind of stepped away from the actual riding part of it in, in the race to more of the management side of it. I enjoy the challenge of the logistics of it, you know, making the plans and how you're going to execute the race, you know, preparing the, the, the machinery and how it's all going to work and getting all the pieces of the puzzle to fit together to come out as one thing and hopefully with the results of you're the first one at the finish. This one over here, this picture 1987. This is the first Baja 1000 we ever won. That was our team in 04 when we won the uh, over 50 championship. Between Malcolm, Jack, and myself, collectively we had 35 Baja 1000 wins. So it was the most winning team ever assembled in the history of the race. Wow. As far as individual accomplishment, all together in one team. Well, I'm glad you guys are here to give man Tanner advice because I don't know what we'd do without you. Chris assigned us our support team. Logistics were run from the office. Jimmy built our custom desert race bike. And Javier Gonzalez and Chad Newman were our mechanics who would double as drivers. Javier is an expert desert rider, guide, and mechanic from San Diego. Chad is a rider and mechanic from Missouri who flew in to support us for race week. Their skills and advice were highly valued. You've got to have a great team, and we did. You guys want to hit it? Yeah. We figured out pretty early there was going to be a lot of preparation involved. Physical preparation, mental preparation, and logistics. You don't just show up on race day with your bike and helmet for the longest race in the world. Anyone can enter the race, but if you just show up with your bike and your buddy on race day, you're not going to get very far. There's a lot of planning and preparation that has to go into it. Pit 10 is over by Coco's, and that's on that dirt road. Maybe we should do a rider change at the pit. I mean, this is a long way for you to go. Well, we could just try it tomorrow. You're going 822 miles, and the bike will run out of gas after 70 miles. So you better have figured out how you're gonna get gas in your bike every 50 miles in the absolute middle of nowhere. Our plan was designed for energy management and to take advantage of where each of our skills would be best used on different terrain. We were going to take six turns each. I'd start the race and Tanner would finish. We had to choose 11 rider change locations based on where the course crossed paved roads where the chase truck could leapfrog the rider to the next rider change spot and get there before the racer did through the winding desert course. I think we should do pit to pit tomorrow. Yeah. This is where we're gonna see you guys. Typically I tell people that are doing this for the first time to kind of race from pit to pit. If you race from pit to pit, then you have a better chance of not missing your pit. You know, a lot of times what we do too, we'll, put a piece of tape on the gas tank or on the inside of the handguard and have your numbers there, you know, mile da da da, it's my next pit. So now your focus is I'm racing from here to here. You know, you're out of fuel, you're done, you know, so. For you guys both to know the whole thing is key because if one gets anything hurt. can happen during the race. The bike that starts has to finish. So if you break down, you're out. This whole expedition, this whole trip Whatever preparation you put forward, your teammates, your chase truck, your crew, whatever you got into it is all for nothing if your bike breaks and you can't proceed. So if you don't have a plan and aren't prepared for problems along the way, 
or if you're not physically and mentally prepared or you get lost, you're done. You're out. And half the teams that enter this race don't finish. We don't want to be in that half. If you want to be successful, no matter what you're trying to do, you have to get advice from experts. And we had an expert rider with us when we were pre-running, Shane Esposito, a pro rider and veteran of the race. The next team will be right here. Okay. Oh, so it comes up this road and then just follows the road? Step towards me and then goes to your right. Welcome to Baja. Do not hit that. pre-running and uh, me and Tanner and Shane were giving a hell for uh, seemed like a long time and we're like how far do we go we went like 55 miles uh, that's it this year the course was laid out at 822 miles and we needed to pre-run the entire course before the race it would take us four days to pre-run what we would have to race in a single day it just seemed impossible rocks over there just like bowling balls that's part of the course we've only gone 100 miles today over all kinds of terrain and we've got to keep the attitude you see a marker on the other side there's a bct so on race day go all the way across to this marker we went 270 miles today that's the most i ever rid in my life. In the race, we're gonna have to go on 425 miles each. We got a long way to go. Up and at them. Another 220 miles to go today. <laughs> we were learning the course and choosing our rider chain spots. We gotta figure out where the truck's gonna be, where Tanner's gonna be waiting. This is not a pit. This is just a rider change, so there might not be a ton of people here. Well, yeah, but this is where the road ends and they go off the course right there. And usually people can tend to congregate around these sections. There might be 500 people here watching. You want to go up there? That's where we're on load. Yep. Pre-running S10. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff you'll deal with on the race course during the day. Yeah. Did he lose it? Fish tailing. Most of the teams have uh, six, five riders. Two riders is most certainly a lot more difficult due to rider fatigue. I think Tanner and Larry, um, they have their work cut out for them, but I think they'll do just fine. Rock whoops. Yeah. Not sand whoops. Sand whoops aren't bad. I know. Whoops are waves of dirt and sand on the race course formed by wheel action. Over time, these waves grow bigger and bigger. In Baja, these whoops can be three feet deep or more. Whoops are physically challenging. Your legs burn as the bike G's out over and over and over again. Your arms and your upper body work hard to hold on. There are many whoop sections in Baja, and one is 100 miles long. We were pre-running and came upon this vehicle that was pre-running too. 
Well, they had a gas can in the back that tipped over, and they barely made it out before the whole thing went up in a ball of flames. Anything can happen in Baja. Having six guys on the team would make it easier, but that's not what we were in for. It's not what this race was all about. It wasn't about as making it as easy as possible. It was about finding a way and digging deep enough that the two of us could finish. I know Tanner. I know his talent, his riding skills, his capabilities, and I'm completely confident in my teammate. I know what he can do, and he knows the same about me. So it gave us a lot of confidence, and we we're able to plan the race accordingly. And it's really special that I can ride with Tanner. From the beginning, I knew it would be difficult, but I knew other people had done it. So if they could do it, why can't we? I've been riding with my dad my whole life, and I know what kind of rider he is, and I know we can do this. Woo! <laughs> That was the longest whoops section I've ever done in, in a day. I mean, you know, it just goes on and on and on and on. And some of them are this deep, you know. You're just like... You feel good? Yep, feel good. Feeling real good. And if I wasn't, I would never say it. Because your self-talk is important. You know, if I tell myself I'm tired, if I tell myself, oh shit, I've got a long way to go, or anything like that, then, you know, that's what I'm gonna, like, be focused on. So, I, I'm actually in my helmet saying, I feel good, I feel good, I feel good. <laughs> Baja, what you wear in the 80 degree daytime doesn't work at night. And if you dress for 40 degree nighttime, you'll overheat during the day. So one of the sections we were pre-running started out with 20 miles of pavement. And when you're riding on the pavement, you're not exerting much energy. So your body's not creating heat. And when you're going 60 miles an hour on the road with no windshield, it's just the full windshield and it was getting pretty cold. I just had a jersey on and I wasn't prepared for the cold weather. I got really cold at that point. Eventually got onto the rocky trails, I expected to start warming up a little bit. But by that point, I couldn't feel my hands, I couldn't feel my arms. We actually went up in elevation too, and it was getting dark. So those two factors made it get cold really fast. It was extremely painful. Oh, I know, it's cold, very cold. My body's not working. I know, my hands are... Tanner's walking to try to get warm. We are freezing. It's almost dark and we only have one jersey on. Finally, we got back to the truck and sat in there and warmed up where Javier informed us it was 39 degrees out. It was bad, it's bad. It took us 45 minutes to warm up where we could function again we were perilously close to hypothermia. It was so cold. Yeah. I was like, oh, this is- You guys should waved us off right there. So we're gonna go 40 miles in the dark. First night ride, first ever, and then be done for today. And we will have gone 205 miles today. Once Tanner and I warmed up, we set out for some nighttime pre-running. This was the first time we ever rode at night. Riding at race speed with only our headlights was new and different, but I thought we adjusted really well. 
Riding the night's pretty good, actually. You know, the lights give you the ability to see all the bumps now. You know, all the big rocks that are sticking up that maybe at uh, high noon, where there's no shadows, you hit. You can't see them in the dust, and all of a sudden now you're hitting some big rocks sticking up that you can't see because there's no shadow behind it. Where at night, you know, your lights cast a shadow on every obstacle out there. I would really know where the radical turns are. Because you could be on a straightaway doing 100 at night, and if you didn't know it was coming up and there was a hard left-hand turn that dropped away or something, and you went straight, people might not find you to the next day if you went off the side of a mountain somewhere. After pre-running most of the course, we needed to rest and recharge our bodies before the race on Friday. On Wednesday, we took it easy during the day and tested the race bike for the first time that evening. We had never ridden the race bike before and we were excited to get on it. Jimmy had built us a desert hot rod and he was proud of it. It's Wednesday, we got one more day till race day and we're testing the race bike. The race bike has about 30% more horsepower and it has much bigger lights. One on, give it five to 10 seconds, then turn the other on. Tanner's third turn, we're gonna put the lights on because it'll get dark and we're each taking six turns, so really more than half the race is at night. There's a lot of uh, things about the race bike that are set up for racing. It will tire your hands and arms faster with more horsepower. So, you know, you just gotta pace yourself. It's got a lot more top end power and uh, the suspension feels really good on the bike. I love it. Huh? More like a motocross bike. Yeah. We got trophy trucks and buggies pre-running all afternoon, all evening. You know, they sound awesome. With 30 hours till the green flag, we still had critical details to finalize. Tire and rim damage is common in Baja with all the rocks and the high speed. So we prepared 12 front and rear wheel sets to be placed at each of the Baja pits, waiting for us in case we needed them. Jimmy and Chad installed the emergency transponder. If you crash and are seriously hurt, you press the button and a Lifestar helicopter is on the way. Hey, you know it's a dangerous race when they give you wristbands and they tell you your, your number in case you get separated from your bike, your name in case you're unconscious, Allergies, medical issues, and prescriptions. <laughs> That's a dangerous race. The race starts and ends in Ensenada, Mexico, a small city two hours south of San Diego that loves desert racing and goes race crazy every year during the Baja 1000. Look at this. Look at this. Knowing we were racers, many people asked us for stickers. We learned that race team stickers were highly collectible in Baja. We had designed and printed some up for race week, and they were a hit for young and old alike. left to start here in Ensenada, was going south six in the morning, it was kind of hazy, coming down there, some guy turned in front of him, he was doing 90, hit him head on, it was over right there. You gotta remember, you know, it's a sport. It's not worth people losing their lives over. You're smart, hopefully you You guys are smart. There's a lot of kind of unknowns. You know, if you race motocross, you kind of know what's going to happen. You go off this jump, this turn, this double, 
This thing, there's so many variables that you have no control of is what makes you worried sometimes. The night before the race, the sun was getting low in the sky and the next time we would see that sun, the green flag was gonna drop on this race and, and it was gonna start. We're in the parking lot across from the San Nicolas Hotel and Chris said to me, we've done everything that we can do for you. There's nothing more that we can do. Now, it's up to you. And it was. Do you have a spot where we can put that at? We'll, we'll take our time to do it right. right. That way we don't leave yeah. without it. At 4 a.m., we woke and got geared up. All the planning, training, and preparation came down to this. It was time to ride to the starting line. Excited, Tim? Oh, yeah. Once I wake up, I'll be more excited. All right, let's slow this pop stand. Bikes from other classes were gathering. The pro and pro lights classes. The over 30, over 40, and over 50 year old classes. And our class, a mixed age class called Sportsman. I'm ready. I'm ready to go and feeling good. We got a plan. We know what we're doing. And, uh, you know, one leg at a time. There were 10 bikes in the Sportsman class, and we would start seven. All the bikes in our class were numbered in the 200s. 214X was us. If we saw a bike that began with a two, we knew we were racing against it. At dawn, they would start letting bikes go every 30 seconds. We were the last class of motorcycles to start. The tension was building, but I had to remind myself this was an 822 mile race. You can't win it on the first leg, but you can lose it if you make a mistake. I had to ride fast, but smart, and manage my energy. Just moving will be a lot more efficient than you can imagine. It was still dark, and I was in the starting line waiting when the bell in the tower tolled. And it hit me. This is it, the Baja 1000. Tanner went with Javier and Chase Truck 1 to get out of town early. The next time I would see him was at mile 80 at the first rider change spot. Chad and Chase Truck 2 headed down a different highway, Highway 5, 400 miles along the Sea of Cortez. He would wait to support us on the last half of the race. bus with flames on it. All right, 6.35, you started.
first 20 miles out of town is the same 20 miles that, God willing, Tanner would travel on the way back into town to the finish line in Ensenada, where I started. I'm watching the hill. I don't see anybody coming down yet, though. I was heading east, and the morning sun was right in my eyes. Couple that with the dust, and it was very dangerous. Motorcycles from the earlier classes began to come through. and turned the bike over to Tanner and Santo Tomas. On most of the course, there's no cell service, so we rented a satellite phone in San Diego that we would swap at every rider change to be able to communicate in an emergency. We'd have to stop, take it out of our pack, and fire it up to use it, but at least it was something. Tanner's first leg was 122 miles, much of it along the picturesque Pacific Ocean. Good start, good start. I came down over the highway bridge, the new highway bridge at like 100 miles an hour, past uh, a guy, and then got up on the dirt and through the hills, and there was lots of spectators, and um, the sun was right there, and the dust, you couldn't see. It was really bad. The Kawasaki came by me, and he was braver than I was. He, he rode into the dust, like not being able to see. I said, man, I'm gonna let you crash. You go ahead. So then went into the pit, which was pretty exciting in that field. Then I took off on the hills and mountains. Passed about four guys there. One of them was in our class. The locals, man, they try to fool you. They screw with the signs. Like, there'll be a big crowd of them, and some of them are trying to trick you, and some of them are honest and telling you the way. You don't know which is which. That was just a warm up. The first uh, Sportman, 266, I believe it is, is quite a bit far ahead. And then the second one was the Cowie. You were third. And the Cowie took off right before you came. If I was close to that Cowie, Tanner's going to pass him. No question. This is really bad. We're chasing Tanner down on his first ride, and uh, there was a parade in town, so we had to get off the main road where the parade's gonna be. Last thing you want is your rider to get the next rider change point before we do. So we'll see how long this goes. It's a different race when you're chasing. When you have a six-man team, you have a lot more chase crews, so they can leapfrog with your riders, where we have to stop at every rider change. We only had one chase, so it's critical that you don't get held up in traffic and you know your way around. So we had our own race also. Oye, ¿qué tan lejos está para atrás allá? Kilometer y medio. Kilometer and a half. How far are we from Santa Maria? Uh, next town. like the amazing race or something. The race is on right now. And I'm sitting in this van at five miles an hour. <laughs> Tanner's out there ripping it.
Finally, Javier decided to boogie up the other side of the road and pass all the traffic at high speed, risking a flat tire on the rough road. Gotta get my boy. Go ahead, Jimmy. We're still not there yet, man. It's, it's gonna be close. I can't make out what you're saying, but we are almost to San Quentin, pit four. The satellite phones between Javier, Chad, and Chris were sketchy. They hardly worked. It made me wonder if the one Tanner and I shared would work if needed. <laughs> Sound when I was trying to call you on that thing. <laughs> this is good up there. Just like right here, up here. Like here. Oye, ¿por qué iba el Oscar para atrás? Sí, ya sé, pero ya hablamos con radio ahorita y... Moneta. Ahí en Erendira. Ah, con razón iba de regreso. Bueno, ya estamos aquí lo que... harder waiting than it is to be on the bike. I passed five bikes in two quads. I was in so much dust, so I didn't even see a line. I know this thing does not work. I went off course many times. Well, I still passed the guys. So we're in second place, nice job. seven guys and as soon as you get close to someone the dust is unbelievable it's hard to breathe I hit 98 miles an hour a couple times which is as fast as the bike will go and I, another time I passed two guys within 10 seconds one guy just passed another guy and then I just passed both of them <laughs> oh and one of the bikes that I was trying to pass kept getting close to him but I couldn't pass him because of the dust he took a shortcut and he got ahead but at least I got out of the dust. That shortcut, he missed two VCPs, so he's gonna get a 40 minute penalty for that. Tanner took the bike from me, his second turn for a 41 mile sprint. My hands were hurting in the beginning, but they kind of settled in. Man, that's fun. Riding is so awesome. And the terrain here is so awesome. You know, the there's just all different terrain and it changes like that, you know? We have completed just about a third of it. And that was the best banana I've ever ate. <laughs> oh, the GPS is not working. There's no line to follow. Tanner said the same thing when he came in. Wanna turn that one on? This is a spare. Sometimes you have to make a call and we decided to take the time to switch out our GPS for the backup GPS. We would lose a couple of minutes, but it'll be well worth it to prevent going off course later. We should be here soon. This yeah. is a really fast road coming up here. I don't think this GPS is working. I don't think it is either. I, I looked at it the first time, I didn't see any line. I got lost a couple times. I saw 281X broke down before the last pit before El Rosario. So I think we're in second. A guy from another class popped out onto the road. 
We had a couple miles of pavement before it turned into the dust. I needed to race him to the paved road speed limit here of 60 miles an hour to get ahead. That would make all the difference not having him making dust in front of me in a few minutes when we turned back into the desert. My third turn was 70 miles. It was the section I was dreading the most. There were lots of tricky, loose rock sections. If your wheel bounces off one wrong, you can be down instantly. I'm tired. <laughs> the first one, I probably went too fast. Not for my ability, but for my energy. Rider Change 5 was the last chance for any chase vehicle to see their racer for 122 miles. Therefore, every race team set up there. It was like a little pit city. The sun is bad, Tanner, right now. The dark shadows are going right into the sun, so be careful. Javier and a friend from another team changed the rear wheel, the air filter, and mounted the big dual headlights. It would get dark on Tanner during his turn. When we pre-ran, we did not see a person, vehicle, or structure of any kind for the entire 122-mile leg. Truly, no man's land. Shane's description of this section was accurate. 20 miles of 100-mile-an-hour sand road, 20 miles of hell, and 80 miles of crap. Tanner took off into the setting sun, and I knew what he'd be up against from pre-running. For some reason, this moment really hit me as a dad. Here was my son, racing away into the desert night. I love that kid. I'm so proud of him. OK, we got a bit of an issue. We missed the gas station to fill up. So the next town, we got to score some gas somewhere. We had passed up the last gas station on Highway 1, and I started really getting worried about where am I going to get gas. There's supposed to be a guy out, in the, out by the road in a pickup truck selling gas. 120 miles back at El Rosario, we had planned to stop for gas, but the gas station was clogged with a long line of chase vehicles. If we had stopped then, Tanner would get to the next rider change before us, so we skipped it. But we didn't realize it was the last gas station for 320 miles. The chase van didn't have enough gas to make it that far. My wrists are hurt. The rocks are terrible. But there was sill. The sill is not like sand. It's not like light sand. It's something completely different. It's like baby powder. The road has two lines in it from the four-wheel vehicles, you know, that are depressed a little. And you take one and your bike sinks down in a foot, a foot of this stuff, and it comes over the front wheel, and you blind your own self. It just sucks you in and, and you know, stops you. You know, you, you wind up, you know, over to bars. The silt is the most difficult part of the course, in my opinion. Um, it's just an extremely fine powder that you have no traction on. You can't slow down, you can't speed up. Don't drop the bike. If you keep the bike up, even if you have to dog paddle with your feet just to keep the thing going, do whatever you have to do because if you fall over in that thing, the throttle gets stuck open. And you've now turned your bike into a vacuum cleaner and all that silt now is right there by the air box being sucked into the, into the filter. You just have to get through it and survive it. I try to pick through, you know, to the side to miss as much as I could. Okay. I'm feeling great, man. I'm feeling better than when I started. My hands are rock solid. <laughs> I keep telling myself that. I should take some more of these, maybe. <laughs> Advil. The gasolina. There's nobody here. There was a gas station, possibly. Not really a gas station. It's the shack with gas containers on the side of the road. Gasolina, nowhere. Beep the horn, maybe it'll come out. We pulled over at one and they said, oh no, they're off today, they're watching the races. So then I got worried again. And where is it? Here, 10 meters. OK. 
Okay, gracias. Gracias. He said the other guys are gone to the races. Finally, we found a lady selling gas from a few jugs on the side of the road. But there were other vehicles yep. waiting ahead of us. Let me go make the deal. It's going to take whatever it's going to take. It's 3.59. Let's see how long it takes to get gas. Javier spoke Spanish, and she came right over and served us first. I don't know who she was, but she just saved our race. We bought, I believe, 20 gallons. I don't even know how much money we spent, but it was all worth it because we needed it. We got news from Chris Haynes. Unbelievably, we were leading the Baja 1000. You know, I'm getting tired, but the other guys got fresh guys. But, you know, maybe they put their fast guy at the start, you know? And they're, they're kind of weaselly guys in the middle, you know? I don't know. I mean, they wouldn't put their fastest guys in the middle, probably, right? They want to make some speed while it's light out. We'll see. We could freaking win this thing if my freaking hands don't fall off my arms. The desert is beautiful, but everything out here will hurt you if you touch it. If you don't tuck your elbow in, you'll be pierced with dozens of thorns and need pliers to pull them out. We try not to think of crashing off course. That would be disastrous. I personally love the desert. I just love the, the way the landscape looks. It's so unique from anything we have in the east. I personally think the desert has a beauty to it. So to be able to ride in the desert, it's a really interesting experience. As beautiful as the desert is, it's also an extremely hostile environment. All the plants have spikes on them. Everything's fighting for survival out there. Around here, a chase vehicle from another team hit a cow and was disabled. I want to hit one of these guys. We gotta pay attention. Baja is unforgiving. Anything can happen at any moment, especially when you're riding at, at really high speed. When Tanner's done with this turn, we'll be a smidge past the halfway point. When he pulls in, I'm gonna have to ride at night on a section I've never seen before. I, I, I don't even know where it goes. It's wild out there. Hope Tanner's okay. Is this it? I think. Yeah, this is it. The race course. Do you copy? Is that Tanner? I can't hear you, but I think I'm lost. The GPS shows I'm 20 miles off the race. I don't know. Oh my God. <laughs> There's a light coming. There's a bike coming. He wouldn't be 20 miles off the race course. He's not stupid. I, I, am I lost? Where am I? Is this the course? Yes, 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 you're on it. You're on it. My GPS shows I'm 20 miles off course. You're on it. This is it. Okay. okay. Yeah, you're on it. Nailed on it. All right, so Straight it just ahead. keeps going this way. Look, it shows me not even close to the course. No, you're on it. You're dead on it. I don't know what's going on, but you can see, I don't know if you can see mine. You're dead on it right there. This is it. Okay. Everything is okay. GPS is wrong. We got to the rider chain spot we pre-selected. Other teams chose this spot as well, along with race fans, local ranchers, who built campfires and would stay up all night watching the race. It's 20 after six, it's uh, gonna be uh, 12 hours soon. The first half is daylight, the second half is nighttime, so nighttime is slower. We expect Tanner here in about uh, half an hour, maybe, hopefully. It looks like, you know, if we kind of do the math on this thing, it could be a 24-hour race. If we can get through the tough whip sections and call Red Bull for help. <laughs>
An ATV came through. ATV started after us. Now hold it together, one section at a time. We're waiting for Tanner to finish his section. Here comes another vehicle. Maybe it's him. So your son is in the way? Yeah. The locals were friendly, and when I told them we were a father and son team, they became very supportive through the international language of fatherhood. All right, so he should be coming, right? A couple quads went by, the pros went by. Tanner passed pit nine, which is 10 miles away at 829. And he's not here yet. I'm flagging every bike. If it's not our bike, so what? Two eighty-five X went by. We were no longer in the lead. He had a pass, Tanner. The locals, who wanted to do anything to help, were honored to hold the sign. In a way, searching for my son. 202X came through. We were in third place now. We monitored the radio for Tanner's voice. Nothing. Each time a light would appear in the distance, our hopes went up. It's very dangerous now. The trophy truck's coming through. Very dangerous. So that's gonna hold them up like two, three minutes. You can't see a freaking thing. You gotta pick your spot and pull over before the truck gets to you, and then you gotta let them pass, and then you gotta wait for all the dust to settle. Last year, a bike pulled over to let a trophy truck pass, then pulled back onto the course. A second trophy truck was right behind the first one. He didn't see the motorcycle in the dust and ran him over. He only had a thin jersey on. The risk of hypothermia was increasing as the night grew colder. This is him, he's very tired because he's a fast rider and he's going slow. It was 9 p.m. He was 90 minutes overdue. Oh my God, Tanner, what happened? Why'd you rip your sleeves off? Because the uh, brake caliper got ripped off. Did you crash? No. What happened? It just hit a rock and it broke off. So you had no front brake for how long? And it was taking the spoke, so I had to tie it up. How, how long ago did that happen? 30 miles. Oh, man. So you used your sleeves to tie it up? Yeah, and then when, 20 miles later, when I got to the Baja pit, it taped it. Oh, my God. And I kept up and stopped like every mile to retie it. My front wheel hit a rock and bounced into another rock and broke my brake caliper off. It was about 40 miles from the truck when that happened, so I had to ride extremely slow and figure out a way to tie it up so that I could even ride. Well, it's the middle of the night, and my brake caliper broke and was hitting my spokes, so I couldn't ride. So I ripped the sleeves off my shirt and tied it up to the fork until I could get some help. Use your sleeves to tie it. I, I was looking That's for awesome. anything. I couldn't find anything. How, how long were you? I, I tried to take apart one of those yucca plants. Yeah. And take the strings off it, but I couldn't rip it. it was Did you call on the radio? Twice. You say you're 20 miles off course? Yeah. Oh, okay. That was Tanner. He proceeded at one third race speed with no front brake, and he had to keep stopping to retighten his sleeves that he used as rope. I was going real good, just going up a hill, my front wheel like bounced off one rock and it knocked into another one. Uh, I was just hanging off. Yeah. I didn't have a knife or anything to cut it. I, I had a hard time cutting these because I had to take it off and smash it with a rock. I was just going real slow all the way back. Okay, no biggie. So we're just going to finish now, right? Yep. Take a break, take a nap, I'll fix this, guys. Oh boy, well, that's Baja, right? Anything can happen. It doesn't mean we're not gonna finish this race.
Javier took the front brake assembly off the pre-run bike that was in the back of the van and installed it on the race bike. The locals all held lights for Javier as he worked. When he came in, I thought something was really wrong because he was wearing no sleeves and I was freezing. I first thought, man, maybe he's like super hypothermic where he's actually getting hot and starting ripping his clothes off. So I was kind of worried while I was working. We had the van on with the heat on. So I said, Tanner, get in the van and sit down. For him to just decide he's in the middle of nowhere, where am I going to do with this brake caliper that's broken? And then he took off his sleeves and wrapped it. That was pretty good. I was thinking he probably watches these survival shows or something, or he has some kind of survival skills. There's still 400 miles. Anything can happen. Once we fixed that, I think we were an hour behind. There's still a long race. Thirty minutes after Tanner limped it in, we were back in the race. We were in third place over one hour behind the leader. I think we all figured we'd lost the lead, and now our new goal was just to finish. No matter. A race is a race. Half hour fix. Yeah, I gotta call Jimmy and tell him. Did you hear me say everything is okay? Huh? You? Yeah. No. I said that like ten times. At this point, our logistics and preparation became critical. Highway 1 runs down the Pacific side of Baja. Highway 5 parallels it on the other side along the Sea of Cortez. Chase vehicles would have to use the unpaved crossover road, which also doubled as the race course, to get to the other side. Javier and Tanner race up Highway 1 to the beginning of the crossover road and unload the pre-run bike. Tanner speeds away down the crossover road, now with no front brake, to get to Chad at Rider Chain 7 before me, and Javier follows at a slow pace on the rocky road. Hello. Uh, we're on the crossover road. I sent the two bikes over to the Chad. Yikes. I want to get passed by a trophy truck here. At night, a trophy truck looks like a spaceship approaching. It's intimidating when it comes up behind you. The crossover was a bit scary with trophy trucks passing you, but we made it through. Eventually, Javier will catch up to Chad, and chase trucks one and two will be together for the rest of the race. 13 miles ahead of us. That's it. We're rocking. We're rolling. We're dirty, we're dusty, we're tired, we're hungry. I'm more awake right now than I think I was this morning, or yesterday morning, at the start. It yeah, will be a 24 hour race. Here we go. We caught up to him right there, that was pretty cool. I really want to lay down right here and go to sleep. You can lay down and sleep on the finish line. On the finish line? On the finish line. I got lost in eight hey, good. minutes. Man, i never seen so many whoops in my life. I go, and then you bring it home. Love you, buddy. Javi, you can hold the bike so I check the oil. I've never been up for more than 24 hours before. I just felt like falling asleep in the truck. Once I got on the, the bike for my last two turns, though, I, I was I was ready to go, and I was riding very good, even though I hadn't slept in like 20 hours at that point. I just had to go as fast as I could. Okay, so Tanner's on his second to last turn, 44 miles. Then I get on. 
Uh, I go 60 miles for my last turn, and then Tanner goes 64 miles to bring it into the finish. So I think we're giving it a great effort, and everything is going according to plan. I waited at rider change 10 for my last turn. A headlight approached. Was it Tanner? No, it was 285X, the leader. 12 minutes later, another headlight approached. Was it Tanner? No, it was 202X, second place. Seven minutes later, another headlight approached. It sounds like a truck. No, it sounds like Tanner. This time, it was Tanner. I was excited. We were still in third place, but now only 19 minutes behind the leader. That was a fast one. I was riding good that time. <laughs> yeah, I was riding good that time. Dang, are you behind us? Yeah, I'm still down here. Are you still waiting for Tanner? Yeah, still waiting. He's he's already got off the bike up here. What the fuck? You, you missed him. I was going too fast. He we'll flew right by you. He was on rails. So he beat us? No, he beat you. <laughs> Damn, I, I never saw him. waiting in the chase truck getting ready for my last turn on the bike which would be the last turn of our race. We were 80 miles from the finish. I was really excited but uh, really tired too. Two miles before the end of my last turn I came in hot to a trench and concrete barrier. Our race was almost over right there. bike came out of the desert. We thought it was my dad, but it was 285X. 285X, the leader in our class, pulled out onto the road and pitted right across the street from where our chase trucks were waiting for me. Don't worry about him. Chad again gave me advice. Just ride smooth, don't ride fast. Don't get excited and throw the race away. You're gonna ride him. I think we promise if that guy gets out of here before you get on the bike, don't go chasing him now. Just let it happen. Just three minutes later, my dad popped out. When I came out on the road after my last section, I looked to my right and I see both chase trucks and Tanner right there. And I excitedly pulled up and I said, pointed across the road, and there was 285X at his truck pitting, and they were putting a fresh rider on. I've seen guys get all hyped up before, and the teams get super excited, and, and then I've seen them crash in DNF, or uh, hurt themselves, you know, trying to race into the finish. You're in first. That's first place, right there. Yeah, you know what? I passed the other dude. Yeah, he's right there. We decided to roll the dice. We didn't check the air filter, didn't check the oil. We just got Tanner on and out of there first. We were leading the Baja 1000 again, and Tanner had 80 miles to go to the finish line. Take off down the road, go about two miles, turn left. Then I, I realized we weren't sure if my dad had missed a pit somewhere. My biggest concern at that point was that we're gonna run out of gas. So my initial instinct was ride as fuel efficient as possible. Then two miles in, I was so relieved to see the pit, but I didn't know how far back 285X was, or if I'd get past while fueling. Tanner won't let that dude pass him. Thank you. Look. GPS is now working. It wasn't working like all race, and it was working on that one. And because of that GPS, I'm here. There was whoops, man, in there. Holy cow. No joke. Dude, I, I, I was like, this is it. <laughs> I'm leaving it all out here. He's such a good kid, you know? Yeah, he is. <laughs> he 
<laughs> comes in with no sleeves. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> I think he could do this, man. I think he could do this. About four or five in the morning, it was completely dark and my headlight was slowly breaking off the bike. I saw pieces of the metal bracket fly off and go by my goggles. Finally, the headlight fell down and was pointing at the front fender hanging by the wire. The last thing I wanted to do was stop with second place right behind us, but I had to. So he takes off his gloves, his goggles, his helmet, his neck brace, his hydration pack, his jacket. 400 miles earlier, I learned clothing could be used as rope. So I tied the headlight assembly up with my sweatshirt. And that's when 285X went by and we lost the lead. I lost four minutes. And when I got going, I had to continue at a slower pace because the headlight was still shaking. About, uh, Five miles later, I had to stop to tighten the headlight again, and as soon as it got light enough to see, I just went as fast as I could. And when the road opened up, I saw his dust, and after that, I just went as fast as I could. When you're riding in the desert and you see dust from another bike, it gets you excited. It's like a shark seeing blood from a fish. That's so awesome, man. A 24 hour race. I was in staging 24 hours ago, and now Tanner's racing to the finish and it's light again. That's <laughs> so sick. <laughs> I was on my way to the finish line in Ensenada in Chase Truck 2, and the plan was that Javier would go to the last physical checkpoint that was 40 miles away from the finish line in Chase Truck 1, watch Tanner come through the checkpoint check with him, give him a thumbs up, and Tanner was supposed to give him a thumbs up back and race toward the finish line. Caught up to the guy in first place. At that point, there was Javier waiting with the chase fan. Javier's watching the last checkpoint, and what does he see? 285X comes through with Tanner 60 feet behind him. Headlight, headlight, the headlight's falling off. And then he comes in, he's got a sweater wrapped around the headlights. And I'm like, oh, what happened now? He took off his clothes again. You good? Well, I don't know if it's gonna shut off. It's supposed to have something charging it. Wanna put something on it? Uh, yeah, it's a stock headlight. The race bike has an oversized stator coil on it to generate extra electricity to power the big headlights. However, the stator needs to have an electrical load on it or else the stator could burn up and the bike would stall. That's why we run headlights even during the day. Fired up. We got to change maybe I think a minute or a minute and a half. Then I got in the van and it was a race to try to get to the finish because I wanted to watch this. If I wasn't there, he possibly could have lost that headlight, could have locked up on his handlebars, because uh, they were just dangling. There's on his way in. Okay, congratulations. The street really slow. I'm worried that, you know, it'll just dump it. The last turn of the race, right before the finish line, was concrete road that was wet and it's just, you know, really slippery. Just walking on it, your feet would sort of pivot as you walked, and I knew that, you know, for motorcycles especially, coming around that last turn was gonna be really treacherous. I got fuel, and I knew I had to catch 285X. I caught him on a narrow part of the course, and it was hard to pass. I was trying to be stealthy, so he didn't know I was there for as long as possible. Finally, I made the pass. I came to a four-way intersection, and straight, there was a wrong-way sign down on the ground. Left, there was a wrong-way sign up, and to the right, there was no sign. So I took a right. I didn't know if it was the right way, but I figured the faster I go, the faster I find out. 
285X followed me, and that was lucky because I went four miles and didn't see any course markers. In my head, I knew that the right way must have been four miles back at the intersection. I needed to take a left, and I knew he knew it too. When we took the right up the hill, I don't think we we're supposed to go that way. The other way, there was a sign that was like pushed down that was the wrong way. Go down that hill. So I followed him back. He was riding into the sun and dust, and another bike, who also went the wrong way, comes screaming down out of the dust right at him. Never saw another, I never seen anything. No arrows, another mark. When I pre-ran it, I thought I came over this hill and went down this way. Let's just go and see if we see a marker. Right? In this race, you're supposed to know which way to go. And this section, of course, we didn't pre-run. The signs help, but somebody messed with them. There was this phone number, and if you text the racer's number to it, it'll tell you his position on the race course, what race mile he's at, and how fast he's going based on his transponder. And we couldn't use it earlier because there was no service in the middle of nowhere, but now that we're in town, we could use it. Tanner, um, we believe, is neck and neck with the other guy. He may have passed him, I'm not sure. And he's uh, about 23 miles out right now. I can't believe this, a cliffhanger ending to the Baja 1000. Did you hear that? They're like, they're like point point one, one mile each between each other. Really? How <laughs> funny is that? 24 <laughs> hours in, 25 oh hours God. in. I went after him, but there was so much dust I couldn't see. And a mile later, his helmet camera cut out. So when he took off across the highway, headlight bracket broke so the headlight was dangling and I had to change the headlight. So that's why we're a little behind. I see this bike coming around the corner. It wasn't him. <laughs> no, it's not Tanner! Woo! It's not Tanner! Oh my god. He should be coming in any second now. This is fast. It's all fast. Yes! Yes! Woo! Yeah. After 25 hours and 39 minutes, Tanner crossed the finish line, 60 seconds ahead of 285X, first in our class. Woo! Good job, man. It's a really difficult terrain out there, and you have to respect it. It's right hard, right smooth. Hell of a story to tell. I was riding way too fast. I was in the lead, took the wrong turn. Oh, he followed me. He turned around before me and was in the lead again. First time here. I passed him in the wash. It was like a couple hundred yards before the finish. <laughs> Tremendous job. They got six people. I know. Yeah. They got six riders. That guy was that guy was probably their fastest. Good race. Good race. Good race. We got lost, huh? Congratulations, my man. Holy, awesome. yeah, good racing. Great work. That was fun, man. That was a lot of fun. Congratulations, man. All right, fellas.
The results wouldn't be official till 26 hours later, 9.30 the next morning, and the race officials would analyze every move that every team made and assess penalties for speeding and a 10-minute penalty for each virtual checkpoint that you missed. The next morning, we were right there to check the official results. We had done it. Father and son, together, had won the Baja 1000. We ran a clean race and had very few penalties. Ten guys in our class and only five finished. This one. We won. Straight up. It's definitely a special breed of person and a very tough individual to, to make it. You have to have a huge amount of heart, determination, and the ability to never quit. I was like, okay, here we go. This is gonna be good. We can possibly do this. The finish was truly a storybook finish. You can't write this stuff. It was a great event. It's very, very tough. Um, this Ball 1000, as all of them, become tougher each one we come upon. And we had multiple different things to conquer at this race. And uh, to come down here for your first time and win the race is an incredible thing. The race is extremely difficult. There's uh, a lot of challenges that you just don't expect. We're a father and son team from Connecticut. We never raced in the desert before. And uh, thanks to Chris Haynes Racing and Javier Gonzalez and Chad Newman, without them, we, we couldn't have done it. It's been a journey. It's been uh... The highest highs, the lowest lows, you know, but that's what life is. You can't get the highs if you don't have the lows. And if you live in the, in the gray area in between in life, then I mean, what else is there? We've laughed, we've cried, crashed, we've burned, we've done the whole gamut down there. If you look back, it's been really great memories, you know. I don't believe in luck. Luck is where uh, opportunity meets hard work and in, in preparation. That's luck. And that's the same in racing. You gotta work hard. The other riders, the mechanics that built the equipment, the guys that are driving your trucks through the night are up 24 hours chasing with you making sure you're okay and, and changing wheels and stuff in the middle of the night and who knows where, you know. You're compelled not to let the team down, including yourself. You want to come through. Nobody does anything alone. And we had a great team. It's really amazing what you can do if you throw your whole self at it and you get your head in the game and you prepare and you're determined not to quit. To be able to do it with my son, just life-changing experience. <laughs>